Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. I'll give a quick warning that I did not get a chance to watch the movie a second time today. I was going to, but we had four inches of snow and I had to go spend two hours cleaning out my mom's sidewalk and driveway. Well, there's no way you could possibly wrap your mind around all of those plot points. <laughs> so I'm just going off of my memory from last week and I did rewatch at least the last 10 minutes just to... To refresh. And I also got very little sleep and I'm kind of like caffeine jittery right now. Fantastic. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. I think it's fitting for this movie anyway. So I'm absolutely at my best. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm excited. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. My name is Alex. With me to my, in front of me, actually, not to my left at all, is my wife. I mean, audio partner, Julia. We have nothing to do with each other. That's right. We're strangers on a train. Hello. And with us, recording live from where he's from, Noel. Your audio partners, I'm the audio stranger, the mystery man on the other line. That's right. <laughs> when a stranger calls and talks about movies. So are you guys ready for a trip to the beach this winter? Oh, I am totally ready for this trip to the beach. To Zuma Beach. Yeah, this one was an interesting one that I didn't even hear about until like last year. Until you wrote it in an email, I had never heard of this film in my entire life. Well, it's been this odd little obscurity, early little work from John Carpenter's career. I don't even think it was listed on IMDb for the longest time. It only just came out on DVD like in the last year because Warner, for some reason, was like, sure, we'll put it out in the archive collection. People are interested. <laughs> Is it a TV movie? Well, obviously they are, since we're yeah. <laughs> three people it was. just watched it and are going to talk about it. Yeah, it was a TV movie produced by Warner Brothers and aired on NBC. Very interesting. I have a lot of questions about this movie. I went in cold just because I think it's more exciting that way, especially with these movies I've never heard of. I knew nothing about the plot of this movie. <laughs> I had no idea what to expect. I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop and it turned into a horror film. <laughs> the only two things I knew about this was it was Suzanne Summers. And it was Timothy Hutton's first acting role. Really? His very first acting role. And two years after this, he would win the Oscar for Supporting Actor. Oh, wow. Good to know. This is usually where I'll go through like a detailed production history of everyone involved. There's nothing about the history of this movie. Yep. It's an enigma. <laughs> I have some speculations, though. Yeah? The original story of the script, John Carpenter did write the screenplay. So it is a John Carpenter screenplay. The original story, though is credited to John Herman Shamer and Al Ramers, or Ram Russ. Ram it comes out like a Scooby-Doo word, Ramers. <laughs> the two of them have been working together as TV writers since the 60s, and John Herman Shainer was the instructor of the Screenwriters Workshop at USC. Hmm. So it's very possible that that's where he met John Carpenter, and that's how John Carpenter became involved in writing the script. And about the other writer, William Schwartz, you guys might know this already, but I'll just go ahead and say it for our readers. The way the Writers Guild is laid out is that the word and and the symbol and mean two different things when crediting writers. If you write out the word and, that means one writer worked on it and then another writer worked on it afterwards. If you use the symbol and, that means they worked on it together. I this know. one has a symbol and, so it's very possible that Carpenter and Schwartz worked on this together. Granted, I don't know if TV movies were following Guild regulations at the time. Mm. And if you look at Schwartz's career, just before this, he had just started as a writer in 1976. So he could very well have come out of the same USC class that John Carpenter came out of. Just as that screenplay, Prey, that I wrote a review about last month, was John Carpenter co-writing with one of his USC classmates. I don't know if this might have been a project that came out of that time at USC and just finally made its way onto TV a few years later. Your logic seems sound to me. John, if you're hearing this, can you confirm or deny? And we love you. And put us in your movie, please. Just one. Will you shake my hand? <laughs> I won't wash it, and I'll sob on it gently. That's true. I'd like a hug. I'm going for a hug. <laughs> but yeah, the only other two names I have to mention are Lee H. Katzen. He was a TV director primarily, did a couple features here and there, but he was kind of like the go-to guy for TV movies in the 70s. Two things that I, I have seen of him, he did a pair of Dirty Dozen TV movie sequels that, you know, nowadays we have the direct-to-video sequels. Back in the 70s and 80s, there were a ton of TV movie sequels. Like There was a TV movie sequel to Gone with the Wind, to The Great Escape, to Stagecoach. 
And they did a number of TV movie sequels to Dirty Dozen that then led into a Dirty Dozen TV series. And they were pretty good. They were pretty nice little competent films. And he also did a weird film called What's the Matter with Aunt Alice, which was a complete ripoff of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. I was going to say, that sounds very similar. It wasn't bad. Basically, your go-to TV director. Not a bad career. And then the other name I need to mention is Brian Grazer. I noticed that. Yeah, just a few years after this, he started producing the films of an up-and-coming director named Ron Howard. And the two of them have been production partners since. Brian Grazer is one of the top producers in Hollywood. He produces all of Ron Howard's films. They own their own production company, I believe Imagine Entertainment. But yeah, one of the biggest names in the industry right now. This was one of his earliest credits. Of course, you got to start somewhere. Oh, yeah. The only other name I want to mention just in terms of connection to other John Carpenter works is that this co-star is PJ Souls. Yes. In the same year that she's in Halloween. Now, I don't know if this led to her being in Halloween, if Halloween led to her being in this, or if it's complete coincidence. It could be because she was already an established actor who was in Carrie just two years earlier. She was probably like a big name at that time. I think she was pretty short-lived, wasn't she? Kind of. Her biggest role was probably Rock and Roll High School, which I think was 8081. It's a classic. It's one of my favorite films. Yeah, I think there was that period there where she had caught their attention in Carrie, did a few films here and there, but never really took off. And yeah, her last two big, right after Rock and Roll High School, she did Private Benjamin and Stripes. And then it was just kind of fell into small supporting roles in TV movies. I think she's the best. Oh, she's still wonderful. She still pops up at a lot of cons and everything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that's all I really have to say about the history and connections of this film in terms of The Carpenter Project. It's a very obscure movie. Mm -hmm. John never talks about it in interviews. I can't find any interviews with anyone else involved who talks about it. I have no history to this movie whatsoever. <laughs> it's just a thing that happened. The podcast is now over. <laughs> but it was just interesting that the guy who's credited with story was a USC instructor around the time Carpenter was a USC student. So it's like, that's why I'm wondering, is this something that began life at USC and then just finally eventually got made a few years later? It sounds likely. The dates add up. Yeah. So unless you guys have anything to add, you want me to just jump into the quick synopsis? Let's do it. Thankfully, I'm not summing up all the plot threads. <laughs> Let's just get a nice little overview. All right. There's so much. It's the Citizen Kane of beach movies. I figure we'll get into the little vignettes as we go through the discussion. For sure. When the last album from aging pop star Bonnie Cat fails to chart in the top 20, she's let go by her record producer. Looking for fresh inspiration and a break away from it all, she heads to Zuma Beach, where she spent many days as a teenager and now gets caught up in the comings and goings of the latest young crowd during the last open day of the season. There's romances and friendships and rivalries, the most central of which are David and Nancy, who just broke up because David wants to drop out of college and travel around, and Nancy wants something more stable. So she's now hooking up with David's best friend, JD, leading to expected animosities, until Bonnie helps David reconsider his impulsive choices and he again settles down with Nancy. People come together to build a sandcastle, play a game of chicken, challenge rival Miami Beach in a volleyball game, and welcome the new lifeguard by dunking the old one in the ocean. And as the sun goes down and the season comes to an end, they take one last dip in the water before going their separate ways, with Bonnie vowing to put the hard work into her music career that she always took for granted. Zuma Beach. <laughs> an epic for the ages. So do you guys recommend this film? Absolutely. 110%. <laughs> really? Okay. I thought it was quite charming. It is not a good film by any stretch of the imagination, but I thought it was a lot of fun and very curious, very odd. Just a strange movie. Who asked for this movie? <laughs> was there a beach craze, like a revival from the 1950s happening again in the 1970s? I have no idea what the market would be for this movie. Julia? I loved it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Care to elaborate? I really did. I loved it. I thought that, well, even within like the first five minutes where you watch the opening with Suzanne Summers with her morning after hair riding down the coast and in her convertible to go and visit her music producer, you're like, oh, <laughs> what are we in for? <laughs> with a song sung by Suzanne Summers. Yes. Even during her conversation with the producer, I was like, oh, I see. And it was already a million times better than the way it looked. <laughs> I was set to hate it from the get-go when I heard the song. I'm just like, oh, I don't like you, movie. <laughs> and then when she started talking to the producer, I started to get weirded out because it's sort of like the same intro to Eyes of Laura Mars, where it's like a professional, and she starts talking to her producer, and I'm just like, oh, when's this going to turn into a thriller? And then it turns into Beach Blanket Bingo. 
And then everyone starts stabbing everyone in the eyes. Exactly. Event Horizon Beach Party. Noel. I'm not going to have quite the same level of enthusiasm as you guys, but I did enjoy it. It was a very pleasant and charming, it was a nice, comfortable movie. The characters were good. The cast was good. It was just a nice little, it, it was like a day at the beach. Yeah. It was like literally just the last day of the season. Let's hang out at the beach and see what all happens. You know, it's various little threads. They all intersect. They all go apart. The cast was a really interesting mix of known names early in their career. Like I was surprised by some of the people who showed up in here mm -hmm. and a group of kids who were really interesting, but their careers never really took off. And so you never really see them again outside of this. It was well put together. It was competently made. My only thing is, I don't know that I'd recommend it as a film that people need to go out of their way to see. Mm. As much as I enjoyed it, it's not worth the 15 bucks that it costs to get on DVD. <laughs> if it's a film that you come across, or it's a film that you actually do want to pursue, you're going to enjoy it. If you have the flu and it's on demand, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice, just little sweet, enjoyable movie. And it's... With the way the various vignettes are laid out and everything goes happily ever, it felt a lot like one of the better episodes of The Love Boat. It did have that TV feel with all the characters coming together, like in that old classic television feel to me. Yeah, kind of like the Fantasy Island or The Love Boat. If you have like these six or seven different stories and it's just like little vignette there, little vignette there, little vignette there. And then at the end of the day, you know, they leave The Love Boat and they go off back to their lives. You asked who was asked or why this exists. I wouldn't be surprised if someone wasn't hoping this would be a backdoor pilot to something. Because you could imagine a Zuma Beach, especially during that time where you had like Fantasy Island and Love Boat, you could imagine a Zuma Beach TV series. That's true, actually. Yeah, based on Here's the, another uh, day at the beach. Yeah. The way the beaches are done is they're seasons. This is the open season. That's the off season. You know, you could say, here's a year where we follow these kids. Now, here's a year where we follow the next kids. And they'd be completely recast and then there'd be sets instead of actual the beach. <laughs> Oh, it'd be a horrible show that would quickly get tiring, but <laughs> <laughs> you could see some network executive was probably thinking, hey. They did have their sweethearts, and they had the fawns pretty much built in with that guy. Oh, boy. That guy was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> he was a total creep, but he was also charming at the same time. King of the beach! That's right. I love, yeah, he's the most successful guy around, but I just kept thinking of the Matthew McConaughey character from... Oh, what was the old movie that was in the early 90s where he was just the middle-aged guy who likes to sleep with oh, high school kids? Oh, the teenage kid? girls uh, stay the same age. He keeps getting older. Oh, what is yeah. that? Dazed and Confused. Dazed and Confused, I yeah. mean, like, here, he's the old guy who makes he himself the most popular guy at the beach by buying all the teenagers booze and oh, yeah. acting cool. He's a total sleazebag. Yeah. Every time he showed up, I want him to go away so I can keep enjoying these people. <laughs> I loved him. He was my favorite part of the whole movie. Oh, I love the actor's performance, but the character oh, yeah, the actor himself was, good. was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alex kept asking me why he was there. And I'm like, yeah. he's the king of the beach. <laughs> he is the beach. He runs who comes in, who comes out, where they get to go, who's there. He knows everybody. He's probably their drug dealer. <laughs> like, I mean, there's a good chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the actor, he's actually probably one of the bigger names at the time. He was a pretty prominent character actor in feature films. He was actually, I just saw him in Black Sunday. Okay. That great terrorist at the uh, Super Bowl scene where he had a pretty significant part. Sadly, he committed suicide at age 49, so his career kind of axes off there in the early 90s. That is a bummer. Yeah, that's a yeah. super bummer. Now I can't refer to him as John Malkovich in shorts. <laughs> Although I just did. No, I still like Except it. I'm going with it. John Malkovich has worn shorts. <laughs> that's what I asked Alex. I'm like, has John Malkovich ever worn shorts? And he thought he probably did, but I don't think he so. He must have, at least in a play. I love this bit where he's like shirtless and saggy and sitting in the dirtiest Water. Was that like mud water? The water was black. I like to pretend he was in iced tea. <laughs> <laughs> iced tea would be a lot better. He's at the beach, so he fills up a life raft with water and just sits in it for half a Dirty day. Dirty water. But it's the dirtiest. <laughs> Grossy. The whole set was not appealing for a beach movie. It was clearly the off season. Like, it's clearly like... It's overcast as hell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And everyone throughout the movie slowly gets more and more burnt. Yeah. But they just get redder and redder and redder. It is also a nipple palooza. Yeah, Because totally. it's cold. Because it's cold and yeah. they're windy. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I want to mention is, before we get into the characters so much, is when I went into this movie, I didn't expect to find much John Carpenter in it. And while I didn't find much of the traditional John Carpenter, or what we traditionally think of, you know, the macho manly action stories and mm -hmm. all stuff... There were parts here that I'm thinking of, there's the two teenage girls that are dealing with their cousin from the South, 
And I'm thinking these are playing exactly like the way the three teenage girls are written in Halloween. That's true. Little things about the characters. And it really brought me back to Resurrection of Bronco Billy. Hmm. There was the scene that we all latched onto in that where he met the woman in the park who drew his picture and then he completely fumbled it by nitpicking it. This feels like a movie written by the person who wrote that. Mm -hmm. It's very natural. Especially in the first half, there's so many failed pickup attempts. Yes. (laughs) It feels like it was written by that person with someone else. Like, you can yeah. tell when the someone else comes in, because that's when you get silly jokes, yeah. people falling over, like, all that kind of stuff, <laughs> where you're just like, oh, that was the other guy. And that's what I'm wondering is, the teen movie like this was not on, I mean, the Beach movies hadn't made a resurgence, but this is a lot like an American graffiti type movie. Mm-hmm. That was a big thing in the early 70s, was that kind of teen movie, high school's coming to an end, college is looming before us, where's our life going to go? And it almost feels like there is a deeper, edgier film that this originally was meant to be. And then they just kept lighting it up. (laughs) But then it was turned into a Love Boat episode. They went looking for a party and instead found America. (laughs) Something like that. (laughs) Especially in like the last 20 minutes where like everything starts to magically work out. It's like, oh, we're friends now. Or, oh, I'm back in your arms. And, And it has that kind of TV movie happily ever after feeling to it. It's true. Not in a bad way. But it also, at the end, there's no growth, really. <laughs> like it's No one changes. Out. No one learns a lesson. Everyone's exactly where they were when they got to the beach. Yeah. No different. <laughs> I know we'll cover that later, so I don't want to go too much into detail on that. Well, I mean, there's some light changes, but there's no significant changes. Yeah. And it's the type of changes that if this went to series, yeah, they would be back in the same boat every week. Absolutely. But there were the changes that everyone really looks for in films, which is the antagonist gets punched and yeah. the good guy gets the girl. I don't think she's that much of a prize. Hey, that's PJ Souls. Watch out. PJ Souls seems like a really nice lady, but her character was not. <laughs> and this is one of the things that's kind of holding back my recommendation of it, is it's a film that, as fun and pleasant and charming as it is, it doesn't really go anywhere. No, not at all. And that's why I'm saying that if it's a film that you watch, you'll enjoy it, but I don't know that it's a film you need to go out of your way to track that. It's kind of like a Sundance movie, but a beach movie for TV. It's a bunch of events that happen, and then it kind of just peters out at the end. In if the Sundance <laughs> channel and the Hallmark channel merged into a channel, this is what their movies would be. It would be Zuma Beach. <laughs> it would be the conflicted indie drama happily ever after movie. I think so, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not completely knocking the film. I mean, it is, a, as I said, a very pleasant movie. Oh, yeah. But in the end, where was the song? The whole point was this I, making the song. Well, there, you never... She... She can't write the song, right? She can't write the song. So she goes to the beach and then she decides to be inspired at the end of the day. And I think that we're going to see her at least start a writing process, maybe throw out a couple chords. I don't know. I think it would be a bit pat for her to go with the completed song into the producer's office. I understand that. But I want to see something. I don't want to see you just smile as you walk away. How do I know you're not just going to go get burgers and still continue to not do anything? Exactly. I mean, she's like, I'm resolving myself to do the hard work. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Like a nice little throwaway line there. Yeah. Also, where was Silent Whispers? Because I never got to hear it. Yeah, I, I wanted to hear Silent Whispers for sure. Because <laughs> it tracked at number 28 she needed for nine s- weeks. She had to sing it to one of those kids. Like at one point, pull out the guitar and sing Silent Whispers and have a moment with one of those kids. And then that's the end of the movie as they're all like, oh, God, it's this song. Yeah. Why are we hanging out with her? <laughs> Can we turn it off? <laughs> <laughs> My mom <Square>. like that. <laughs> And then cut to, like, Norman in the background going, like, oh, this is the best song ever. <laughs> I'm the geeky guy. <laughs> Let's just stick with Suzanne Summers here for a second. I mean, just in general, it's a typical Suzanne Summers role. I would say that if you're a Suzanne Summers fan, you should go check this out, because it's a good Suzanne Summers role as she's coming right off of Three's Company. Mm-hmm. What is a Suzanne Summers role? I only know her from Three's Company. It's just Suzanne Summers being Suzanne Summers. Yeah. This is more like what Suzanne Summers is like, not the ditzy character she played on Three's Company, but I mean, it's just, if you like Suzanne Summers, this is a nice little, you get to watch Suzanne Summers for 90 minutes in a swimsuit, which was kind of an ugly swimsuit, but yeah. I really dug her swimsuit and all. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty great. <laughs> you like your retro pieces. I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah, it does. That was the type of swimsuit my mom always wore, so that's indelibly in my mind. Actually, I think the back tie was quite playful. I think the front, <laughs> the bandu top, granted, <laughs> but the back tie was quite interesting. Okay. It was a good detail. You guys brought up swimsuits. 
<laughs> but I mean, it's, I have many comments about various swimsuits in the movie. <laughs> and you are the floor is yours for swimsuits. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that if this were the Suzanne Summers podcast, this would be a much higher recommend. Absolutely. This is the John Carpenter podcast. If you're going in looking for John Carpenter. I think you'll be let down. But I think what was interesting about this was, as I pointed out, the resurrection of Rockabilly, teenage girls. And there's also other characteristics that I – this is making me look at John Carpenter's movies more differently in terms of how he builds his characters. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking like, yeah, you know, Bonnie Cat actually reminds me a lot of the Adrian Barbeau character in The Fog. You know, some of these other characters remind me of characters we'll be seeing coming up and like Christine and stuff like that. I'm seeing a side of John Carpenter that I'm not used to. And that's actually intriguing to me. He's not just a genre director, he's a director. He can actually do other things as well, and write other things. Obviously, this wasn't his direction. I mean, as we pointed out in Assault on Precinct 13, half of what makes that movie work is the characters are so well-developed. Absolutely, 100%. It's not just that it's a badass action movie, it's that it's also a very compelling character piece. (laughs) So you guys want to talk about bathing suits again? or? I want to take a second to remember Lee from Assault on Precinct 13, since we were talking about uh, strong characters. Let's all just have a small moment of silence and think about Lee. Let's all just let our arm go limp. Yep. All right, back to it. (laughs) But one of the other major threads of this is the whole romantic triangle between, what are they, uh, David... Oh, I have it all written down. I wrote it down. Yeah, tell us what it is then. David who and who? J.R.? There's more characters in this movie than Dune, so I wrote down everyone like a fantasy novel. My best friend is dating my girlfriend. I'm angry. Yeah. Well, I'm angry that you still want to date your girlfriend that you dumped. He had no reason to be angry. No. He was so volatile and angry, except for the motorcycle in the sand, which he deserved. He did deserve. Other than that, he had no reason to be such a he had dick. A massive chip to be chip. fair, JD was kind of a dick too, but he was also responding to the antagonism. It's true. JD is evil. Michael Bean. Horny. What? That was Michael Bean? That was Michael Bean in an early role. That was one of his first roles. It wasn't his first first, but it was like his third or fourth. Who's Michael role. Bean? Terminator, The Abyss. Nope. Aliens. Action movies in the 80s. All nope. the ones that you didn't watch and I watched when I was a kid. I have sisters. I don't know what these things are. I mean, I know what Terminator the Abyss is, but if I don't know If you're not a fan of James are. Cameron movies in the 80s, you're not going to know yeah, Michael Bean. Yeah, Michael Bean. If you're a fan of James Cameron movies in the 80s, Michael Bean is everything. Yeah, it's true. He's a wonderful movie. Well, I liked his face. There you go. I yep. responded positive to We're on the same page. JD is the bad boy. Yeah. With the brown hair. Yeah. That was Michael Bean, right? Yeah. Because David was the good boy with the blonde hair. David was Kevin Bacon. David was the one on the motorcycle who was going to leave town, so he broke up his girlfriend. Who should be Kevin Bacon but isn't. Right. Yeah, they all sort of look like other actors. And as the story goes along, JD just starts randomly punching people. It's true. (laughs) He's got a lot of anger issues. (laughs) I'm going to punch you. Now I'm going to punch you. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to punch you. It did solve a lot of problems. He was having a rough day. (laughs) He was. I like that it was one day. So much happens. Like, I can barely get to the store in one day. The problem with this romantic triangle is that, again, it ends on a very predictable happily ever after note, where JD is painted as the bully and he gets shown up, but he finally mans up and he just shakes his hand and admits that he went too far. It's true. And Nancy and David end up back together and he's like, maybe I don't need to leave town after all, because I was going to leave town with creepy liar guy. Problem with the love triangle is that woman wasn't worth fighting over. I think they all weren't worth fighting over. I think they're all creepazoids. Oh, yeah. They all don't deserve love, but she especially. They're just normal teenage kids. Code B. (laughs) (laughs) Where they have to pick a guy to go on the shoulders, and she looks right at him and stands in front of her ex boyfriend and then runs giddily over to the guy, his friend, who she's supposedly sleeping with, leaps into his arms and then turns around to make sure he's watching. Cold. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty hard. This one, it seemed like it was setting up more interesting things. Like, yeah, you had that whole thing of her and JD spent the time in the lifeguard shack and everyone thinks she slept with him, mm-hmm. which makes her feel embarrassed. And you think, is that really going to go anywhere? But no, she just talks to David and they sort it out. But is everyone else on the beach cleared up on that? No, they all think that they had sex. Also, were they supposed to have spent the whole night together in that place? I think they slipped over in there. On the hard floor with one blanket on top of them in a bikini in the freezing cold and then waking up to blazing heat in a tin box. (laughs) Yeah. See, and then there was also this odd tension that started between Bonnie and David of like, are these two going to hook up? That was like that with Bonnie could have hooked up with anyone. Oh, yeah. There. She could pick up the litter. She was a very strange, she was like a touched by an angel type character. 
Well, it's like she showed up at the beach. Everyone wanted to see her ass and hang out with her. Yeah. It was outrageously uncomfortable. Could you imagine, like, you're guys, so you don't think about this, but as a woman to come out of the change room in my bathing suit and have six men follow me while making grunting noises while I go into the water and splash playfully... To have yeah. repeatedly men come up to me and try to get me to go in their van and their teenage boys? I question that her morals. That is where I think this movie is a little dated in terms of some of its sexual politics. When you put it that way, it's frightening. It's a very <laughs> harassment is okay movie. She could not even get to the beach. There was people harassing her dangerously on the road all the way yeah, up to the, the beach. Yeah, the two guys yeah. in the car, yeah. They were driving right alongside her. And I love that in movies, for some reason, I don't know like this works in real life because I have not been approached while in a convertible. But why is it that when guys are trying to get you to go with them, they always say, come on, over and over again. Come on, come on, come on, let's go do this, come on. Especially when they're the ones who want to do the coming on. It's true. It's true. Usually what I've witnessed in the city is they pull up and they try to get the girl to smile first. Hey, come on, give me a smile. And the girl's clearly like, please leave me alone. And then they um, call her name and move on. See, and then her, she doesn't seem even offended by any of it. Oh, no, she's loving it. She's really all class and charm and just completely shoots everyone down. Yeah, because she's not really loving it, but she's kind of like, oh, you. It's like whimsical. She's amused by it. No, she loves it, because otherwise, why would anyone put up with that? I guess so. Why would anyone who's just trying to have a quiet, reflective day on the beach, so she says, put up with a bunch of guys literally... (laughs) I think part of it, and this doesn't really come across very clearly, is because she is the aging pop star who I think she's being reassured that she, you know, she still has that flair. She can still catch the eyes. But, you know, they never really do anything with that. No. She just builds a sandcastle. She is someone who's passing the prime of her career. Once they set it up, they never really follow up on it. They don't follow up on it. Even the fact that she's a celebrity is just, like, not even commented on at the beach, even though half the people notice her and recognize her. She has no arc. Her arc goes up in the air and never comes down again. (laughs) Exactly. It's like she shows up at the beach and then all of these other stories happen around her, Mm -hmm. some of which she occasionally ties into, and then they just leave at the end. Maybe that's intentional. Maybe that's the way to get her mind off her own problems, because all these other people have these admittedly bullshit problems. Well, maybe that's how the TV series is going to be. Of all these things happen, Suzanne Summer shows up for five minutes, resolves everything, and then we go on to the next Doesn't sound like a good show. (laughs) It'll be like, as you said, Fantasy Island, where she just solves these problems and then goes on to the next problem. Fantasy Island is a good show. I'm not saying it's not. Oh, I'm not either. I'm I'm not criticizing those shows when I compare like this in Love Boat. Suzanne Summers is no Ricardo Montalban. It's that kind of storytelling formula. Oh, yeah, for sure, especially in the 70s, where it's episodic. It was big in the 70s. Like, they even had a show that was set on a train. They had a show that was set on an airplane. Yeah. That it was like, okay, here are the passengers this week. Here are the various little stories. Then they leave. It's like a monster of the week, but the monster are people with issues. Yeah. And it's almost like the main recurring cast are just tiny little background figures that just kind of anchor everything. For sure. Absolutely. And that's why this movie, it felt like it started as something different, something more American Graffiti-like, and then it kind of became something that could potentially sell a series if it did well. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an odd film. It feels like it's trying to be one thing and then it's trying to be another. It's not a horribly glaring imbalance. It's not one of those ones where it's like whiplashing you back and forth. But if you think about it, it really does kind of stand out as, okay, this doesn't seem to be quite what they were building to. Yeah, for sure. One of the problems with a lot of the Love Boat and Fantasy Island stories is a lot of them were kind of formulaic and predictable stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, like even here we have the whole Norman, who's a very lovable, delightful character, but it's the whole, no girl likes Norman. Norman does something that catches a girl's attention. Girl likes Norman. Norman should have just taken his shirt off because he was stacked. Yeah, that girl did more than like Norman. <laughs> that went from zero to sex. I love how Bonnie has the idea of, I'm going to build a sandcastle, and it triggers into this kind of big communal event with Norman at the center of it. And then the attachments that he builds, even though the sandcastle thing gets all messed up by JD, mm-hmm. the attachments that he builds then stick. And then as you go on into the story... As J.D. continues to antagonize him, Norman has already forged all these other attachments so people have his back. That's true. And you have that great bit at the volleyball game where he just finally decks J.D. and stands up to him. Norman is the real star of this movie. (laughs) Played by a guy whose name I love, Biff Warren. I wondered which one was going to be Biff, because I saw his That's name in the Biff. credits. I'm like, oh, remember when people used to be called Biff? No one since Biff the 1950s has been named Biff. <laughs> he never really went on to much more of an acting career and sadly passed away in 1993. But 
oh, hey, right after Zuma Beach, it was on an episode of Fantasy Island. It all comes full circle. Here's the thing with Fantasy Island, guys, because I know you're dying to know. It's on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I've watched some of it. So I started watching it because I never really watched it, except for, I guess, a bit when I was a kid, but I don't really remember. At the point where I'm at now, which I guess is like season two or whatever, it's Fantasy Island. Like everything that you remember, there's two or three things going on. People are wanting to, you know, reenact their own funerals to find <laughs> out, you know, like who's stealing their money. And like mm-hmm. people are trying to be a real lady, you know, like <laughs> that sort of thing, yeah. like a makeover type situation. The first pilot episode was oh, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> the first pilot episode, it was almost like Lost. It was like it was really a full crazy, movie. twisted stuff. It was crazy. Remember, it was the guy who wanted to like go back to Nam with his friend? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was like, they were going to die at any second. There was traps. They had to sign a waiver. <laughs> like, <they're> real bullets. <laughs> the guy who murdered a woman and like wanted to go back and reenact it because he couldn't remember what happened. <laughs> And then they yeah. let him walk away. <laughs> well, because it was originally supposed to be, if you had the money to pay to do anything on an island, exactly, what would you yeah. do? And it was literally anything. It wasn't just about falling in love every week. No. It was, it was like the most dangerous game type scenario shit. where yeah. you could like hunt a man and like yeah. do whatever you wanted. But they will teach you a lesson. Absolutely. What would the lead of Wolf of Wall Street do? <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I, yeah, I, I saw the original pilot TV movie in most of the first season, and Love Boat actually airs on one of the local networks here every Sunday, so I have caught a handful of episodes. But yeah, it was just an interesting time in the 70s of these odd anthology shows that they set up. To me, it almost felt like Meatballs. A little bit like Meatballs, So yeah. like the guy yeah. who's king of the beach was Bill Murray, yeah. without the humor. And it wasn't a zany, you know, yeah. like, but it was that kind of idea of a group of people, a group of kids, and they all had their own separate stories. And Bill Murray kind of like circles around it. He has that thing with Roxanne. But other than that, he just is kind of like watches it. Mm. So I expected the King of the Beach to kind of have that role. And Meatballs came out the year after in 79. So I guess yeah. it's that same type of feeling. Right. And then The Burning came out the year after. <laughs> What's The Burning? <laughs> it's a horror film about a camp. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, that one. So anyways, Zuma Beach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, then thinking of some of the other characters, then you had the three teenage girls. There were the two girls, one of whom was Rosanna Arquette yep, in one of her that. early roles. Rosanna Arquette was looking good. Yeah. And it was the whole thing of, you know, they're the city kids and they have their cousin from the South yep. who ends up really knowing how to roll one hell of a joint. <laughs> For a TV movie of the week in the 70s, wow, there was a lot. Of they actually skin. showed the weed. Yeah. And yeah. it was a lot. That was like a good ounce. Yes, it like was. Like a full close-up of showing how to roll it and everything. <laughs> Actually showing the smoking of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this was... Yeah. You would think on a TV movie of the week that that would be the cautionary tale. But no. This movie must have aired at at least so 10 Though so I did like her joke about how I only smoke it when it's been chemically tested by a doctor so that all this horrible, horrible stuff that I'm going to list to you doesn't happen. That was a big fear back then. They used to have a lot of TV movies when people would smoke weed or angel dust and they'd jump out movies and they yeah. were Helen Hunt. I think the character was Kathy, played by Kimberly Beck. Hold on. Yep. I have Kathy Texan. (laughs) Black bathing suit. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, and then she ends up being the one who hooks up with Norman. That's right. Norman, who I refer to as Mark Hamill. (laughs) He did look a little Mark Hamill-ish. In the beginning when he had his visor and glasses on. And they hook up and he is too afraid to perform. Yeah, I love how he's got the glasses and the visor pulled down so low that he has to tip his head back like 90 degrees. Because he's a nerd, forward. even though he has the body of the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> I'm trying to think of some of the other character stories. I mean, there's not really a whole lot to say about <laughs> any of them, except that was that person, that was that person. Like, I mean, there was the kind of gawky teenage kids who wanted to score with girls, but then we only just see them in the background. Mm-hmm. There were the two kids in the car who met her on the road, who the one guy who was leaning out of the car and shouting at her never really does anything else in the film. Nope. And his friend, though, has that great bit where he pretends to be his own yuppie father <laughs> in I'm hitting in the on her. business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually really liked him. I thought he was super cute because he had that lisp yeah. and he was trying so hard and he actually thought quite well on his feet, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone had a lot more confidence than they should have. I think that's also the Carpenter influence. There's a lot of quips. Yeah. And then there were the two girls who were almost the kind of gossips of the beach, the ones who were listening at eavesdropping in the bathroom. Oh, yes. The girl with the shirt. And then did you recognize the one with the dark hair and the white bikini? I called her Catherine Zeta-Jones, <laughs> which I know she's not, but that's what I called her. That is Tanya Roberts, who played Sheena in Sheena. She was in Beastmaster. Oh. Okay. She was in one of the Bond movies. Nope. I mean, yeah, so I after this, she actually had a pretty good career there in the early 80s, popping up in a lot of A-list stuff. She was on Charlie's Angels in, in the later seasons. 
And it was interesting because she is kind of known for being a very, how do I want to say, a pinup girl. Mm -hmm. She has a very attractive figure, and most of the roles that she's in are about she is extremely hot and is often wearing a bikini. What I liked about her here is that she wasn't playing like a cheesecake role. She wasn't playing a love interest role. She was playing a comic relief role. She was. Of her and the other girl or the gossips of the beach. And kind of a second fiddle to her friend as well. Yeah, yeah her friend had more lines than she did. She did. Well, she was a better actor. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> It was just kind of neat seeing Tanya Roberts in something that's so against what Tanya Roberts usually gets cast in. She probably had fun, too. Because between Beastmaster and Sheena, she was known for having probably the most amount of nudity in PG movies. Really? It's interesting seeing how many familiar faces. Like, you had Timothy Hutton as a young lifeguard. You know, Tanya Roberts. You had Rosanna Arquette. Michael Bean. You know, it's just interesting seeing these familiar faces in some of their earliest roles. Oh, it's like teen movies and horror films debut a lot of young actors. I mean, like, then there's the whole lifeguards, where you had the main lifeguard, he pretty much closes the movie. It's the true. entire movie ends with, like, the end of his story, and it's like, we didn't even know that this was a story that was going on. I didn't know this was his last day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he's training him in the beginning when they're doing the running on the beach. He's like, this is going to be your job next year, so I need you to step up. And no, see, I didn't think He's, like, agreeing up. with him and saying, absolutely, and, like, let's run six miles instead of three. See, I didn't pick up. I knew he was training in the younger guy, but I didn't know it was going to be he was leaving until, like, they yeah, got to the last leaving. scene. It's, it's like, going to be wait, his what? beach next year, but he needs to invest in a new hat. It's true. Why is it 18 sizes too small for him? See, but that was what was interesting about the film is you had so many vignettes, you never quite knew where the focus was going to be from scene to scene. Like, I didn't know that the film was going to end with that guy, but I thought it made for a good ending. Well, I think the most important scene was the burger stand, the owner and his young chef. You using that takiyaki sauce? Yeah. The racist owner who learns to uh, embrace, what did he call it? The bug juice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whose young Asian fry cook wanted to keep putting soy sauce on everything. For no reason. Yeah. Just because he's Asian and likes soy sauce. I guess so. And then everyone is like, hey, that tastes good. Hey, you go ahead and put this bug juice on everything. Like, oh, At least he had a positive ending, which is more than a lot it of... It did, but yeah. <laughs> it was the time. It was indeed the time. Everyone was hella racist. <laughs> I'm trying to think, was there even a single black person in the movie? Yeah, we saw one. We were looking, and we saw okay. one. We're like, yay, someone of color. Well, you saw the one I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the guy who just ran across the screen? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it was um, really like the briefest of cameos. That was not even a cameo. That yeah. was a background actor. Background actor who walked by. I always liked the moments in the movie where it was about everybody coming together. Like, you had the sandcastle, you had the chicken race, there's the whole volleyball game that our beach ends up losing. But even then, they get a nice hero moment for Norman. Mm -hmm. I thought she was trying to, like, that might have been part of her arc. Like, she was talking about how when she was a teenager, she would, like, build sandcastles and have fun on the beach. And I thought she was going to try to bring them to, like, a simpler time. But that was giving the movie it's, too much credit. It seemed to be, like, there were times in the story where it seemed like it was going to be that she's the person who brings them together and inspires them to go out and change things. But it never followed through on it. No, it just felt like someone's older sister hanging around, basically. Yeah. Well, she says to the guy when she shows up that he's like, oh, you're, you know, a bit old to be hanging around here. She's like, I used to hang out here. He's like, what did you do? She said two things, build sandcastles and write poems. What one of those two things do you think would be more helpful for her career right now? <laughs> <laughs> Her whole purpose is that she needs to take some time to write a new song. I think Sandcastle. Sandcastle. That's the way I'm going to go. Yeah, then I, I love the whole last exchange of, I'll keep an eye out for your records. I'll send you free copies. I said, yeah, where are you going to send them? Care of the beach? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you have no idea what these kids' last names are or where they it's live. It's like they didn't exchange cell numbers or anything. They did not. I did like the idea of two records showing up. Yes. <laughs> Just on the beach. Just like, on the beach. Washes up on shore. <laughs> Delivered. <laughs> to David, care of creepy guy. Yeah. <laughs> Just slide him under his van. He'll make sure it gets where it's going after he listens to it a few times on his own, rubs it against himself. Yep. <laughs> You know, it, it is a film that it feels kind of rough, it feels kind of polished, and it feels kind of like it's trying to do some things, but it still is a really sweet charm. <laughs> it is very charming. It is very charming. I actually wrote, this movie is a delight. <laughs> it is. It is a delight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not great. I don't know that I'm ever going to watch it again, which is why I was actually not entirely looking forward to having to watch it today. I'm kind of glad I didn't have to. But, you know, it was enjoyable, but it's like a film I'd, I'd need a little space for him afterwards. Oh, you don't need to see it again. I worry I would be bored if I watched it a second time. There's no reason to, 
revisit Zuma Beach. I would watch it again. Would you? You'd return to Zuma Beach? I would return to Zuma Beach. Probably Alex refers to them as my period movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a bit too much information, but they're my lady films that I like to watch when I don't feel well. <laughs> Does not have to be lady cycle related. But, you know, I've got some classic in there. You know, some big business, uh, Troop Beverly Hills, Clueless, the good ones. Mm -hmm. I would put that right. on there. Yeah. I would put that in rotation. Absolutely. I'd be curious to see if it stays in rotation after two, three times. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, 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 I mean that sincerely, lot. yeah. It's just one of those things that you would catch. Like, if it was on, you'd just watch it. I mean, yeah, if I caught this on TV when it was on, I would be like, this was enjoyable, and probably not remember it a month later. That's true. And again, that's why my recommendation is kind of mixed in that if you see this movie, you're not going to hate it. It's sweet. It's fun. It's entertaining. It'll delight you for an hour and a half, two hours. But it's not something you need to see. It's not something I'm going to say, yes, go track this down. Yeah. Especially at the Warner Archive, it's great that they're getting out of a lot of obscure stuff, but it doesn't need to be 15 bucks for a single bare-bones disc of an NBC TV movie. That's true, yeah. I mean, this may be three, five, maybe seven bucks tops. But I think maybe that's how they get you, because it's for collectors and completists yeah. that would pay that amount of money for something that's obscure and not going to make money. So I can't yeah. see a lot of people at Target being, oh, wow, uh, $5 Zuma Beach. I've never heard of this. If I weren't collecting everything and you know for the purposes of this John Carpenter project, I would never have a reason to buy this movie. You'd have no reason, yeah. And there's no really any way to see it other than to buy it, the DVD, because it's not airing. It's not on any streaming sites. Yeah. I have no reason to even know about this movie if it weren't for John Carpenter's ties to it. Because even looking at the actors' careers, the actors that I'm familiar with, if I were skimming through their IMDb database, that would just be one of those titles that I'm not familiar with that I would overlook. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't be like, hey, what's this Zuma Beach thing? <laughs> I'm trying really not hard here to not sound like I'm knocking the film, because no. I'm not. It is what it is. It was an NBC TV movie of the week. The title doesn't really make you think of anything either. Like, when I first heard Zuma Beach, I thought it was going to be a Vietnam movie. <laughs> I thought it was going to be that movie with the frisbee that has the blades on it. Oh, a uh, hard ticket to Hawaii? <laughs> That's what I thought it was. <laughs> Alex, tell me what your favorite part of the movie was. My favorite part of Zuma Beach? Yeah, because I have a favorite part, and I want to see if it's the same as mine. Oh, And, and Noel, too. I'm trying to think of what it would be. Hold on. Noel, do you know what yours is while he looks? Uh, I'm actually thinking. Okay. You want me to tell you guys what mine is? Yeah, you tell us yours. Okay. Mine is when John Malkovich in shorts and Suzanne Summers go for their walk together because he's trying to woo her because they're the only two people who are roughly the same age. Yeah. And they go on that walk down the boardwalk together. Mm. And he basically calls her on her shit where he's just like, doesn't believe that she's a singer, doesn't believe all this stuff. Whereas what's funny about it is the fact that he's the one who's lying yeah. about everything that he's yeah. ever done. But he's just like, there's no way that you're these things. So she's like, I don't care whether you think that or not. But she's like, but you know, why don't you think that? Because obviously she only cares about herself. So he basically nails it and like mm -hmm. does a whole like psychiatrist routine where he's just like, no one who has a music career who looks like you should be hanging out with children. <laughs> <laughs> Which is even more ironic because he shouldn't yeah. be hanging out with children. Because <laughs> he's essentially telling her everything about himself. Exactly. It's true. He's I projecting. really liked it. I thought it was clever and I thought they both did a really good job. They did do a really good job. I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, no, that was actually a really good scene, yeah. It was, for sure. I have mine now. Okay, go. Mine is the restroom scene. Where, okay. you know, it's the two girls listening as, you know, David is trying to psych himself up. As no one does. To hit on Bonnie. And it's just a really nicely played scene. And then also just, you know, Bonnie hearing all of this and reacting to it. And also finding out little details about it. It's almost like the fairy godmother forming her plan. Mm -hmm, for sure. It was just, it was a really nicely put together scene. I'm stealing Julius. <laughs> <laughs> well, my favorite part of the bathroom scene is the fact that he has this whole speech and these women on the other side of the vent can hear everything he's saying and are laughing out loud at it, yet he can't hear them exactly. laughing out loud. <laughs> One way vent. <laughs> but I, I also like those characters of the two girls because they were just, they would always just pop in, have some really funny lines and then go away. My right. favorite is that she held her hairbrush on the side of her string bikini like a gun holster. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> I think they were the stand-ins for us, those two girls. They were us yeah. in the movie, <laughs> saying what we would be saying. Ah, you know you're the hot one in the bikini, right? <laughs> <laughs> With the belly necklace? Mm -hmm. Oh, God, yeah, the belly necklace. So there's a lot of weird lines in this movie that kind of stuck out with me. I liked um, having a... Oh, yeah, sorry, we got to take a break again. 
That's fine. Go ahead. Our daughter has learned the word help, so yeah. she uh, uses that with gusto. All right, we uh, got her down. Sorry, we should probably get back to it because she's going to go get back up again. And there she there is. There she goes. <laughs> okay, we're going to try again. <laughs> sorry. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Remember? Hey, Alex. Yeah. Talk about the slap off. Oh, yeah, where they solve their problems with oh, yeah. punching in the arms <laughs> or kind of slapping in the arms. That was uh, something else. <laughs> yeah. That's how I solve all my problems. I've just never seen it on film before. It was weird. <laughs> well, you know, that's how I thought the first Terminator was going to turn out with Michael Bean. It was close. Just, just him and Arnie punching each other in the arms. You got an arm bruise, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Alice, did you ever say what your favorite scene was? I'm going to go with Julius just because I don't really have one. <laughs> but I did like it when he called her on that. That was a pretty good scene. It added a bit of depth to this uh, summer beach blanket bingo romp. Now, here's my question, then. What's your least favorite scene? Interesting. Mine would be Creepy Guy in Dirty Pool. Creepy Guy in Dirty Pool? Because I just couldn't stop looking at that horrible water. I'm going to go with PJ Souls with jumping into JD's arms. I'm going to scoop it right from under okay, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> Julia's giving me the head shake. She's not happy that I did that. My lips are pursed. It's true. <laughs> I'm in for it later. I'm not pleased. <laughs> I'm going to have to go with when Suzanne Summers came out of the washroom for the first time. And got ogled and followed by six men. <laughs> That's true. One of them I, who I believe referred to as, who does she think she is? God's daughter? What does that even mean? <laughs> like, that means she's is Lady that, Jesus. She's Lady Jesus? That's what I said to you. I'm like, that means Lady Jesus. That's not hot. No. <laughs> Jesus is not hot. These guys didn't really know what hot was. They were really... Strange. There were some pretty classic jokes in this movie, though. What was the moose joke? Oh, oh, oh God. Oh, God. Uh... This is where I regret that it's been a week since I watched the movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> she turns around and she's like, well, why don't you just go love a moose? And he's very confused. She's like, they only mate once a year. <laughs> she had a lot of information on mooses. <laughs> she was well informed, considering, you know, she lives in California. To have no respect means you have to sell ladies shoes. I learned that from... <laughs> I love the odd random shot of just the old guy cleaning fish at a water fountain. I loved him. <laughs> it's like you never see him again in the entire film. That was film. fantastic because that's when you first see the comical couple for the first time. And they're like checking out hot guys. But it kind of looks like they're checking out the guy cleaning fish. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. He's got a job. so maybe That's right. That. Oh, those are the, that's who else I forgot about was Norman's friends. The friends who are trying to show that we can hit on women. There was the one guy who went up to Arquette and was like, aren't you Miss Universe? Oh, yeah. That totally worked, though. <laughs> and it worked for him. And then the other friend got completely shot down. I can't remember how that one went, though. It's, yeah, but I, I love that, that that one guy complimented her. You're Miss Universe, weren't you? And he ends up hooked up with her for the entire film. Yep. He's got it made in the shade with her. I like the scene where it was the, uh, we're going to do this. Um, oh, what's the... Uh, the dance where it's the girls pick the guys. Sadie Hawkins. Yeah, we're going to pick our partner Sadie Hawkins style. Both me and Alex said if it came to that, we would just walk away. Yeah, I know I'd be picked last. <laughs> <laughs> I am not interested in number one, sports of any kind. Number two, competition in any form. Number three and worst, you have to be picked scenario. Yeah. <laughs> I also love that the only ones who are allowed to play are already established characters, not the other people no standing around the beach. Only 12 people at this beach. It's like Saved by the Bell. They would only pick those people to be in any school project. There could be 100 people at the beach. You're only picking those 12. I think my uh, favorite botched joke in this movie was when the one guy says, oh, they're getting up to just some extracurricular sextivity. I'm like... <laughs> All you had to say was sextra curricular activity, and that's way funnier. <laughs> way funnier. They needed a rewrite on that one. Yep. Though I will say, having teenagers slipping in sex puns, interesting for 1978. You didn't usually see that until the 80s. They really slipped a lot in there. This was like a proto-porkies almost. <laughs> well, because I was saying to you, I thought it was at least 1984. Yeah. And then you're like, no, look at all that feathered hair. And I'm like, yeah. granted. Fair granted. hair on everyone. It all yeah. looked like extras in like Charlie's Angels. <laughs> What was it? Who said pleasure is my business? Pleasure is my business. Pleasure. That was Jerry, the <laughs> king of the beach. Yeah, I like him. <laughs> <laughs> and his gap tooth. It's true. I don't, I don't have anything else to bring. Oh, you know, a couple of the original songs, I did like how they were trying to go with the Beach Boys flair. Oh, that was terrible. The bullshit didn't entirely Boys. pull it off, but it was kind of an adorable attempt. It's true. They did. I think it doesn't help that I dislike the Beach Boys so much. <laughs> so that when you have someone who's actually trying to sound like something I don't like badly. <laughs> they did it better in uh, Phantom of the Paradise. They had a bullshit Beach Boys band called the Juicy Fruits. <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise. Look it up, guys. Come on. It's great <laughs> 
I know what and you're talking about. And apparently Delta Burke showed up as someone on the beach. I didn't spot her. No, I didn't spot Delta Burke at all. And I would know. Unless she was that middle-aged Italian lady that I saw on a wide shot once. Delta Burke would have been only in like 20 at this time, so. Yeah. Then I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think she would have been the Delta Burke we know from no. designing women. <laughs> it's the only one I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't really have anything else. No, I think uh, I'm surprised we got this much out of Zuma Beach. I think we've reached the end of the day at Zuma Beach. What are we going to do next? Next is going to be the big one. Yeah. Next is when we finally get to Halloween. Do, 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 do. The one with Jamie Lee Curtis? That is correct. The one and only. The, the, the one that launched queen. a subgenre and cemented John Carpenter's name. This yes. is going to be the first movie that we do that I've seen already. I have a Halloween tradition. I watch it every right. way for it. Halloween. Ooh. So modern. <laughs> so I think it's a film that we all have experience with, and we're probably all going to have things to say. And I'm going to have some stuff to say. I'm a little concerned about it. I think we get a lot more material out of films we either don't know or don't like as much, because I'm worried that I'm just going to fawn over this movie like nobody's business. I'll start talking about bathing suits. Don't worry about it. All right, cool. You can, uh, yeah, bring us down. Michael <laughs> Meyer in that two-piece was just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> sure I'll have comments. I already remember a pair of pants that she wore. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> they were wide leg trousers, high waist. They looked great. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this movie was missing, a slasher killer. <laughs> That's right. It's true. Although it always, I was always a little on edge. Like, I still have, like, trauma jaws. Yeah, he kept time. waiting for someone to get attacked in the water. There was a dog that looked like Pippin. <laughs> That was a delightful pup, and he had not an evil thing in him. Yeah, it's like you're waiting for something to happen, something horrible to happen, like a shark attack, or someone goes postal, or someone finds the girl that the creepy guy has locked up in his van. And it never does. It, everything just ends up on a pretty positive note. Yep. Even when he is revealed to be the liar, it's still kind of on a noble, that's okay, kid, you still got it in you. They still treated him as the noble adult. Absolutely, yeah. No, he had no comeuppance. They still thought he was pretty boss. No, and he I just don't walks over to like all. a twelve-year-old and says, "Hey, kid, want a beer?" You can see it in their eyes. Mm. He is no longer the king. We say he's no longer the king as he has his arm around two wi two women. He doesn't have to learn a lesson. <laughs> Obviously, he's not going to learn a lesson. He's a liar. He's a compulsive liar who's trying to form his life into an easy sort of lifestyle that he thinks he believes in, when really he's just a failure. These kids, because they're kids don't know that, you know? Like, so you can thrive off of that. You can be the older cool dude and it doesn't matter that, you know, you live in your van or whatever it is because that's cool because you don't live with your parents. <laughs> and like, you have this like cool lifestyle so that's cool too. But you can see it in David's eyes when he finds out that he's a liar that this person that he idealized, this person who he thought he wanted to be is not that person at all. You can see the heartbreak. Yeah. <laughs> but it still leaves creepy dude in a position of power because all these kids are going away. They're going off to college. They're going off to live their lives. And he gets a whole new generation of kids There's to play There's nothing with. that's going to make that power go away besides, you know, like him being held up on rape charges. Like, yeah. <laughs> like well, yeah. or well, him going to Noah's jail. Saying. It's like he's going to get a fresh new batch of teens and they're going to think yeah, he's exactly. the bomb. But, a fresh you know, new like, teens who don't know this. end, though, I mean, he's still always going to be dead inside. To always have to have meet new people to think that you're cool is not any no, way I to know. live. <laughs> we know that. No, I know, but I love that the very last thing he does, the very last thing we see him doing, is going up to a 12-year-old and saying, if you help me with this, I'll give you a beer. That's criminal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, this kid, well, maybe like 15, but this kid, obviously a very much younger teenager than the other kids. Because he's fresh And he meat. says, hey, yeah. do you want a beer? Help me with my stuff. Yeah, and isn't that the saddest of all? Because he'll always be going home alone. That's true. But that says this film. It's, it's a day at the... Nothing really happened in this film. It's just, you know, yeah, things happen, but it's stuff that probably the next day will change again because it's it was just another day in these kids' lives. That's the tagline for the poster. No one As learns the world on Zuma Beach. Yeah. <laughs> these are the days. <laughs> but I mean, this could very easily have become like a soap opera or like a love boat series. Yep. I can totally see how they may have considered this as this could be another ongoing thing. But then I bet you anything. It was just like, oh, God, we got to film at that fucking beach off season every single episode. No dice. It's going to be cold, the weather, wind. Not always going to get the colors right. It's like I can imagine why it didn't become a series. I think HBO should bring it back. It could be the beach movie version of Friday Night Lights. Though it'll be like the nasty, grimy Spring Breakers type show. Oh, yeah, it would. Zuma Beach with the heroin needles and condoms littering the oh sand. Oh, my God. <laughs> and someone trying to build a sand castle while high on meth. 
it's the castle, man. It's the castle I escaped from. It's the castle that's the <laughs> window that I climbed down. <laughs> but yeah, Zuma Beach, I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad that I got to see this interesting, different side of John Carpenter. For sure. It's so different from what we know John Carpenter as and what we'll see him become over the course of his career, but it's a nice bit of interesting perspective. The lighter side of Johnny C. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting This I would very much hold this in the same part of his career that Resurrection of Bronco Billy is in. Yeah, for sure. It has a very similar arc to Bronco Billy. No Nothing actually happens. whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> I was being a little more. <laughs> nice I'll just say it right out loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I don't know that people need to go and hunt this down. I'm sure most of our listeners aren't going to hunt this movie down. I'm sure a good chunk of our listeners are probably not even going to listen to this episode just because it's like Zuma Beach. What? You guys totally <laughs> should, though. Of course, we're saying this at the very end of the episode that they've already skipped. Exactly. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, it's a perfectly fun, charming movie. It's interesting. It's got some neat cast. It was neat checking out just to see the familiar faces in early roles. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a film. I don't know. It's probably just going to sit on my shelf for the rest of my life, you know? Most likely. But one day, maybe, when you're like 75 years old, you're like, I'm going to take one more trip to Zuma Beach, and it'll be the best day of your life. Until that day comes, Noel, you can just send it to me, and I'll put it in my Lady Period Day section of our DVD collection, and then I will mail it back to you when you're ready. Yeah, at 75. At 75. <laughs> if they have mail anymore. <laughs> or I'll give it to you through our mind melt. We'll send it through drum. <laughs> if you guys want my copy of Zuma Beach, you're welcome to <laughs> <laughs> Probably the only time I'll ever see it is if I ever have a kid and it's like, kid, we're going to go through all of Johnny C's movies. And he'll be lucky. In which case, they see Resurrection of Bronco Bill and you're like, fuck this. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's I, I, I enjoyed the movie. It was a pleasant surprise. Exactly. It was, as Julia says, it's a delight. It was a delight. I found mm -hmm. it delightful and frivolous. I thought there was some real deep moments there, Alex. I don't think it was frivolous. But I mean, yeah, Halloween is going to be a very interesting shift. Man, that's we're going to be heading off into the races now. Oh, yeah. We're in it to win it now. Between Halloween and like for like the next few years, this is like John Carpenter on a roll. Oh, yeah. But it'll be interesting when we get to more because what's really nice is that Zuma Beach and Eyes of Laura Mars. I was a little worried about including the stuff that John just wrote instead mm -hmm. of directed. But, you know, both of these have been nice surprises, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing some of the other ones that came out. Oh, I'm glad you talked us into it. I was very surprised. Pleasantly so. I yeah. And even that script that I wrote the review for, Prey, mm -hmm. was like, that was just a really neat surprise. You know, it had a few problems, but it was a really neat scene that John puts a lot of the same thought and effort into just these scripts that he spat out over a three-year period that he does in a lot of his directorial efforts and produced some really interesting work in its own right. I think we're falling in love with John Carpenter all over again. <laughs> or for the first time. It's true. I'm the first time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I think that brings our episode to a close. For sure. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Masters of Carpentry is a Made of Fail production. Made of Fail dot net. We were unpopular before it was cool. I'm so excited that we're going to get to do The Fog. I haven't seen that in so long. I did, well, I, I just saw it a couple years ago because we did The Fog on remakes. Yes, yes. You've done a few uh, Carpenter films on remakes. Uh, just Halloween, Fog, and Assault. So, once we get past the early 80s, we'll be through... Oh, no, Village of the Damned, too. Yep, there you go. Oh, yeah, we get to do Village of the Damned. It'll be a while till we get to that one, though. Oh, right? yeah. We got a ways to go. Which one are you most excited for coming up? Oh, boy, Thing is going to be interesting to discuss. Mm-hmm. Um, you no, know, I actually really like Ghosts of Mars, and I'm going to be curious to discuss that one, because I think that one gets kind of a bad rap. I have not seen that film since, I believe, the opening day in theaters, so I'm very curious to watch that one. <laughs> Anything that's science fiction or action or action science fiction, I will see opening day, or have in my life. Now I don't see anything. And I'm also really looking forward to Elvis and Someone's Watching Me, just because I haven't seen those two yet. Nor have I, so It's yeah. the unknown carpenter. There we go.